Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to All Space Considered. Uh, we have a terrific show for you tonight. Um, it is the first Friday of February. I don't know how we got here, but it is in 2022. And our wonderful show, we have What's Flying at Mars with Dr. Matt Gollenbeck um, from NASA, JPL, and Caltech. Of course, we're going to do pretty pictures with Katie and solar system weather. Um, we'll have our sky report out to launch. And then at the end of the show, We'll talk a little bit about uh, astronaut anemia. We'll go uh, talk about undersea volcanic eruption, whatever could that be that has been in the news. And then finally, a mysterious radio emission from an unknown source. Okay, I added the word mysterious there, uh, but it was a little bit strange. So we have a really fun show for you tonight. I hope you enjoy it. And let's uh, dive right in to uh, our, our beginning here. We've got uh, Dr. Matt Gollenbeck with us. And indeed, he's gonna tell us all about that helicopter that's flying around on Mars. But first of all, we had him on our show, gosh, I think it was back in 2017, if I'm remembering right. And we asked our audience where perseverance should be sent. So let's take a look at what our All Space Considered audience voted on. How many for Jezero Crater? How many for Northeast Sirtis? And how many for Columbia Hills? Oh, we like hot springs. <laughs> we like hot springs. <laughs> so does that reflect the votes, uh, what, the, what you just saw in the distribution here? Does that sort of reflect what no, happened? No, it does not. <laughs> <laughs> so um, tonight, uh, Matt, our audience did not quite vote for where Perseverance was, was sent. Um, so uh, Jezero Crater was picked and fantastic location so far, but I'm gonna let you tell us all about that. And thank you for coming back and joining us here at All Space Considered. I can't wait to hear all about uh, what's been going on with the helicopter and Jezero Crater. Thank you again for joining us. My pleasure. It's really fun to be back with you all and uh, what a spectacular uh, location you have and a treasure for Los Angeles. So I always enjoy uh, joining you. So, so what is flying at Mars and why do we care? <laughs> so, so Mars is in a period of what I would call renaissance. There have been about 10 missions successfully flown to the red planet in the last 25 years. But you know, why? What's so special about Mars? Well, 
first of all, it's the most Earth-like of all the terrestrial planets. It's the first other planet that humans will go, no place else they really could. It has seasons and days, it has an atmosphere and polar caps, and it has volatile exchange. So uh, it's, it's kind of like the Earth in, in a lot of important ways. But in others, it's really very different. Uh, it has a very thin carbon dioxide atmosphere, and it's so cold and so dry that liquid water would not be stable on the surface today. So you would actually be below the water triple point so that you would either have ice or you would have gas, but you would not have liquid. And yet when we look into the past on Mars and one of my favorite images from the Viking mission 45 years ago, um, we see a very different story. We see these, these little channels. Let's see if I get this to work. There we go. So these little, oh, no, that didn't work. Just bear with me. I know I can do this. Here we go. So there's a channel and there's a channel and there's a channel and you can see all these channels that are going down to about the same elevation, which I'm kind of tracing out here. So they all flow down, they carve through the terrain and they all end at what looks like a common elevation. So you could take a location here that is basically showing what the surface would have been like that had liquid water sitting on the surface. And I know that because all of these channels end at the boundary I'm drawing here. And there you can see some channels there. We go around here. And when I get to the lowest point here, I see a single stream that exits and flows out. So there was a natural dam here and the water sat here for some period of time um, and a long time ago. Now, how do I know how old this surface is? You can see there's lots of these big craters and you can see these craters have flat floors. So they've all been filled in and the rims are all weathered down and eroded. So, so something was eroding the surface. And if you were to count all of these craters, you would get an age of about 3.6 to 3.8 billion years ago. So what's so important about that? Well, it turns out that uh, on Earth, life started at about 3.6 billion years ago. And the one absolute requirement for all life on Earth everywhere, no matter where you go, is liquid water. And so the presumption is that if you found liquid water elsewhere, you would have a potential habitat for life there. So here's Mars right next door in our solar system. And it had liquid water at the same time that life got started on Earth. So I would say you could address one of the most important science questions we scientists can, can address, and that is, are we alone in the universe? Will life form anywhere that liquid water is stable? Or do you need some happenstance, some one in a zillion chance occurrence that would lead to life? And you can study that in a scientific manner by going to our neighboring planet. And that's why there's a Mars Renaissance. That's why there have been so many missions that have gone to Mars in the last 10 years. And, and the, the most recent one, and in some regards, the most fun, uh, is the Mars 2020 rover. And this rover is kind of like the Curiosity rover. It's about the size of a, a small vehicle. Uh, it has six wheels and it's got an imaging camera and it has a uh, a, a bunch of instruments at the end of an arm that can in fact core and take small cores and put them in little test tubes and seal them and save them for a potential return to earth. So this, this mission is the first of what we would call a sample return mission uh, that could come back from Mars and bring samples from Mars, from a known location on Mars with a known stratigraphy and a known setting 
um, for study on Earth. And the thing that we're looking for is bugs. <laughs> we want an ancient habitable environment at about the same time that liquid water was stable here on Earth and life formed. And where's the best place to go? So, so the place that was selected is called Jezero Crater. Uh, it's, it's a large uh, impact crater that's quite old. Uh, you can see there's a channel that uh, enters and breaches the wall of the crater here. And there's this feature that I'll call a delta. And to geologists, there aren't that many features that you can look at from space and know exactly how it formed. And a delta is one of them. And it forms only when you have a large river carrying sediment that enters into a standing body of water. And what happens is the water enters from the, from the river, enters, the, the velocity of the water drops, and the sediment drops out into this lake in a very deterministic way, where you have the coarsest sediment deposited close to where it first enters the water. And as you go further and further out, it becomes finer and finer grained until only you have clays that are deposited that slowly drift down from the water. And on Earth, these are among the most biogenically active locations on our planet. You can think of this river as carrying all these nutrients entering into this uh, stable, quiet habitat of a lake. And we sort the sediments by grain size from near the mouth of the channel to out on the edge. And you can tell by looking at the layers in the delta exactly which environment you have. This particular crater with this delta has clay minerals that were deposited in what we call the bottom set beds, which are just filtering out of the water. And these are the places where on Earth, the clays sequester organics and sort of um, put them in little tombs that keep them safe from uh, subsequent um, loss so that you could go there and find these sediments and find the evidence of life if it existed at that time. So, so that's why Jezero Crater was selected uh, and that's why we went to this particular location. It did in fact carry a hitchhiker. <laughs> it <Yep>. was planned. <laughs> that hitchhiker <laughs> was the Ingenu Ingenuity helicopter uh, and it was put on as a technology demonstration to show that heavier than air flight was in fact possible on Mars. The Mars atmosphere is about six thousandths the pressure of the Earth's atmosphere, so it's very thin. And it took quite a bit of work uh, looking at analogs and so on uh, and uh, pumping down vacuum chambers to that pressure to show that we could actually design and build a helicopter that could fly in the thin Martian atmosphere. It was carried uh, by the uh, uh, Perseverance rover, which looks a lot like the Curiosity rover. Uh, there it is sitting on the surface after it was deployed. Um, it is a technology demonstration. Uh, it was designed to have five flights over one month. There were no <laughs> science requirements. In fact, there was no science team uh, outside of me. I was kind of a scientist that got on, but I wasn't allowed to do any science. <laughs> that wasn't <laughs> quite true. I managed to anyway. <laughs> the nominal flights were just a few minutes. Uh, it could fly several hundred meters in range. Uh, five to 10, maybe it could go to 20 meters above the ground. And it carried two cameras and nothing else. Well, a few other things, but it had a navigation camera that looked straight down, black and white, and a color camera that looked off to the side. Uh, it communicated back to the helicopter. So all communications went from the Earth, uh, sorry, to the rover to the helicopter, and from the helicopter to the rover to the Earth. So the helicopter always had to stay within, oh, say a half a kilometer or so of the rover for that communication. And the idea 
Okay. And can anybody see what I'm roving around and showing? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, guys. I thought I was showing everybody everything, but no, I'm still not working. Let's try that. We're getting the laser pointer working for you folks. Okay. We're trying to. Anyway, the idea is to scout for the rover. Look at the regional geology, uh, identify the best locations for the rover to look at, and help the rover to traverse. And in order to do that, you need about 10 times better resolution than what we currently get from orbital images of Mars. And these are called the high-rise images, and they're at about 25 or 30 centimeters per pixel. But our experience with rovers driving on the surface is that we want about an order of magnitude better than that. We want about three centimeters per pixel mm. to be able to see the rocks and better understand them and do this sort of planning for the rover. So the idea is to have this rover and have it fly around and help have the helicopter fly around, help the rover pick the best places to go. This uh, helicopter is a, a counter-rotating blade design with a small solar panel on top. Uh, inside a warm electronics box uh, is a laser altimeter, an inclinometer, uh, and the various computers that run the, uh, the uh, sensors, uh, as well as, of course, the little landing legs, four landing legs. The uh, whole thing weighs about uh, 1.8 kilogram. Let's see, multiply that a bit to get pounds, uh, but it's not very big and it goes about a meter or so, three feet from end to end on the uh, carbon fiber blades. It's carried uh, like a pizza in a pizza box <laughs> on the <laughs> bottom of the uh, rover. Uh, here it is folded up down here, you can see, uh, and here, is a Perseverance rover in our uh, clean lab at JPL. Uh, and there you can see one of the, the blades. And it's carried inside, uh, this is the pizza box here on the ground. Uh, we find a location to deploy it. We drop the, the, the pebble shield or pizza box, if you will. Uh, we drive away from that uh, and we find a smooth flat place in which to uh, a de a deposit the helicopter. Uh, the legs fold out as you saw. So the first one, it rolls down with two legs out, the other two goes down and then it falls and drops to the surface. And then the rover, uh, well, we took a picture first, but then it drives away and we see it from a small distance uh, to make sure that we unlock the blades uh, and we did an initial spin that you can see on the right. And then the very next thing to do was to try it. Let's see it fly. So here it is, the helicopter or the rover's about 60 meters away. Uh, the first flight was up to five meters. Uh, it held steady, pretty steady. Uh, and then it landed back at the exact same place. Again, we had to pick a smooth flat location for the helicopter to land at because it's not very big and obviously you can't land it on a rock that would that would be a bad day on Mars. Um, so there's our first so we were happy campers. Uh, well, and everybody was happy because it's just a totally cool little gizmo. <laughs> uh, the uh, technology demonstration was five flights. And the first five included taking off and landing. We had one where we moved a couple of meters. We went one where we went 50 meters out and back. Uh, and then we flew 133 meters out and back to find a new place that we could land because mm -hmm. we thought that the orbital images were not high enough resolution to be able to pick a safe landing site for the rover. Uh, sorry for the helicopter. Here's the, here's the flight to the new airfield. Uh, here is where we deployed. Our initial flights were in this areas, which were scouted out by the rover. And we saw a relatively smooth location down here that we thought would be suitable for landing um, the helicopter. But we didn't know what it looked like in high resolution. So to see it, we flew all the way down there, took some pictures and flew all the way back. Yeah. Here is the flight coming back. 
from that uh, epic flight, if you will, 133. It's coming all the way back to the same place we started, and then it is landing. There it goes, landing back down. And we took the images that were collected uh, from the navigation camera, these black and white images, and we looked at them and said, hey, this looks good. There's no rocks there, so we can fly down there, and that would be our new airfield. Well, if you think about this for a little while, this is kind of an inefficient way to get around town, right? Every time you want to go to a new place, you have to go fly there, image it, and then go back and then fly there again. So each time takes two or even three flights to get there. And we said, well, that, that's, that's, that's sort of limiting in how far you can go. Uh, and it's limiting in trying to keep up with the rover on its traverse. So the next flight was in fact down there uh, taking those images. Uh, we looked at the images. Here's the high rise images at the base. Here are those navigation camera images overlaid. And you can see, we kind of thought there might be a rock there and there, there's a whole bunch of rocks and it's a ripple as well. And you can see we're now we're resolving rocks at the scale which we would be concerned for landing the uh, helicopter. So, so this looked pretty good. And we kept staring at this. We kept saying, well, gee, if we saw a place that didn't have any of these spots, so here's the high rise beneath it. And here is the helicopter image we put on top. And you can see there's just no rocks there whatsoever. So if we look at the images in mm -hmm. high rise and we see locations that show not even an inkling of a rock, then it's probably gonna be safe. Uh, and here's what it looks like from the surface. So, and we've used this technique now for one, two, three, four, about 10 other flights. We're at flight 19, so 16 more flights, uh, and we've been successful every time. And this is my portion of the, the job of the helicopter is to find the next airfield. <laughs> okay, so here's the flights to date. Uh, the yellow shows the rover as it drove, drove down around the edge of this very rough area with these large ripples and outcrops called Sita. Uh, and it drove all the way around it because it was too afraid to go into it. But we, because we can fly <laughs> with our helicopter, flew straight wow. across it in an epic flight that was 600 meters long and landed here before the rover ever got here. And then we continued to scout out into these areas uh, where the scientists had an inkling that they might want to go and see, but it wasn't clear that there were traversable paths uh, or that it was safe to do so to go inside this area called Sita. So, mm -hmm. so here's where we landed down in this location. So here's the Delta. We overshot a bit, landed here, and we drove down and around here that's shown in this uh, situation here. And what I'll show you is some of the flights here that we did to help out the rover uh, in its path and in its job. So this location uh, is, is right here. Um, this is an area that in the orbital images, uh, the scientists felt that there would be good samples of rocks to go and investigate, uh, but they couldn't tell from the orbital data whether this was a traversable path. Uh, and here are uh, stereo images acquired, color stereo from the uh, cameras on the helicopter that were taken. And the rover planners that plan out the rover traverses determined that this was smooth and safe enough with small ripples, uh, and they could get to this location uh, without uh, a lot of difficulty. So, so this was uh, our first example of scouting out a path uh, for the rover before it ever got there. The rover was still weeks away from even arriving in this location. And the helicopter was able to determine that, the, yeah, those rocks were there and that there was a traversable path to get to those rocks. So, so this, was, this was a real plus. In addition, uh, a, a, a right next door, you can see what look like these strata or layers uh, that are next to the edge of Sita. So this is Sita here with those large ripples. 
here are these outcrops of lighter tone rocks. And it looks like there's a ridge of rocks here and a ridge of rocks here. And we took a flight here that went out and we imaged on the way back here, a series of stereo images of this region uh, to get a better clue about what's happening. Uh, and here are those images and it looks like there's layered strata. So here's, here's a layer, here's some other layers. It almost looks like there's fine layering in between. There's a layer and there's a layer. And the layers within CETA here are diving down beneath. So these layers are older because they're underneath uh, these newer layers that are up top. So this gave us a, a terrific view of the edge uh, of CETA and some geologic clues as to how, how this area formed. And uh, we made it into a, stere a stereo digital elevation model. Uh, digital elevation models are what we scientists use to measure uh, thicknesses of layers and sizes of blocks. And, and it gives you quantitative information for uh, measuring and looking at things. And, and, and we've been having great fun looking at those. So here is uh, where the helicopter is right now here. I think since we took this, the rover has traversed back this way. The plan is for the rover to drive back pretty much along the way it came, uh, maybe with a slight detour here. And it would then continue up around CETA because this area is too rough, to, too, too rough in here to actually drive over would continue around here all the way across to the edge of the delta and image the delta layers here that are so beautifully exposed here, and then scout out here to figure out which way to go up on top of the delta. And we think this is a likely traverse path. So with this in mind, the idea is to uh, get the helicopter there first, and to acquire some of these stereo images along the edge of the delta, and in fact, image this potential uh, this potential valley where the helic uh, the rover might drive up to the top of the delta, uh, and see if we can get uh, stereo data to determine whether there are traversable paths, and to get some initial data on the edge of the a delta that would give the rover a better idea of where to look uh, in more detail uh, from the ground. And to do that, the plan is for the helicopter to hop up and go back pretty much to this region. Uh, and uh, we're hoping to do one of two things. One is to follow the rover all the way around like this, but that's going to be a lot of flights. and. And the other is to fly across CETA, which the, of course the rover can't do. Uh, and this would be awesome areas to take uh, detailed images on the way. Uh, get over here, in fact, uh, before the rover does and begin to investigate the edge of the delta and look and help it, help it on its next uh, phase of exploration. So, so that's the Ingenuity helicopter uh, designed for five flights and now we're at 19. <laughs> <laughs> so it's still Great. going. Wow. Um, and uh, we have a new lease on life. We've, uh, we're funded for the rest, of, uh, the rest of this year, as long as the helicopter continues to operate uh, to try to help the rover uh, in, its, in its path and in its job. Mm -hmm. That is just fantastic news that we get to continue to see the helicopter in action and get great results out of it as well. And oh, yeah. um, I, get, I have a couple of questions to start us off. We've had several in our YouTube chat that we'll get to. I'm curious, do you have any idea how CETA formed? Is the, are those volcanic layers or were those laid down um, some in, a, in another way? Uh, I thought yeah, I had heard so they were volcanic, but what, what's the word from you? You're the one exploring it. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. And so the, the rover has uh, lots of detailed instruments. We have microscopic images. We have chemistry and mineralogy from them. And so far, both CETA and the layers above it are, in fact, volcanic or what we would call plutonic rocks, which are hmm. volcanic rocks that cool more slowly at a deeper level. So even though we saw those strata at the edge of CETA, those are in fact volcanic layers of one on top of the other. And so we're probably looking 
uh, at an eroded surface, right, to erode CETA to get down to the material beneath it. Uh, that mm. kind of makes sense when you look at all of those all those ripples, that's that's aeolian activity that's moved material around and 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 put it into specific places. So that isn't at all what we expected, right? Yeah. <laughs> the idea is to go find sedimentary rocks. <laughs> and we got there. And, and actually, to be fair, there has been quite a science debate about what the rocks on the floor of Jezero Crater have been. And one of the hypotheses has been that it it was in fact volcanic. Um, I'm very skeptical that the delta where, where I've told you that we know those are sedimentary rock, that's where yeah. we're gonna have sedimentary rock. So there's yeah. obviously an interesting interplay between are those the volcanic rocks that preceded the delta and the delta was deposited on top of them. Uh, and those are the kind of things that we'd hope to begin to ferret out as we, uh, as we move around, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's um, kind of exciting. I mean, you said plutonic rocks, rocks from very deep. Uh, that's how that's, deep? An, inter that's yeah, an interesting how, result. Yeah, that's right. And of course, on Earth, the way we get rocks from deep up to the surface is by tectonics and mountain building and plate right. tectonics, which which has mobile mobile plates on the surface that crunch around into each other and raise up giant um, giant uh, mountains. Uh, we don't have plate tectonics on Mars. So how do you get exposures of rocks that have been uh, at some depth? Now, these probably weren't that deep. Um, the okay. crystals aren't giant there, but, but they are dominantly what we call olivine. Uh, and mm -hmm. olivine is the, the first mineral to, um, to solidify out of a mantle melt. Uh, and uh, mantle melts that uh, come to the surface quickly are called basalt. That's the most common rock type on Earth. All of the ocean floors are made of basalt, and a big chunk of Mars is made of basalt too. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one of our uh, people on YouTube typed in a question, wanted to know um, a little bit more about the Wright brothers fabric that is included with the helicopter. Oh, Whose idea yeah. was that? And um, what you think about that? Yeah, so yeah, we took, uh, we carried a small uh, swatch of the fabric used on the wings from the Wright brothers, uh, and it's to signify this is our first powered flight uh, on another planet, and that's uh, that's pretty significant. So uh, yeah, we were pretty happy about that. Yeah, that was a, a really nice uh, way to honor that initial flight and to commemorate this first flight on Mars. Yeah. And, and another uh, person typed in, want to know how long is it going to take us to get to the Delta? And I'm going to modify the question a little bit. How long will it take the rover? And how long would it take the helicopter if you were just a beeline there? <laughs> um, if, if we didn't need, so remember, we're kind of tethered by the distance we have to stay to be able to communicate, right? We can't get more than 500 meters to, you know, maybe a kilometer at most from, and we need kind of line of sight too. So we can't have mountains and hills. And we've been doing very careful looks at the topography to make sure that the places that we fly to would have a comm link to the rover when it's there. And that if we were to try this flight across CETA, we probably need to land somewhere in the in the middle there and we need to have communications back as well. So, so um, it, it's unclear. I would say it's certainly weeks to maybe a month uh, for the rover to go all the way around. It partially depends upon how much science it does and if it decides to sample other rocks, that slows you down. Uh, the rover, just um, the last downlink from the rover, the rover did the longest drive on the surface of Mars ever. So hmm. that was 263 meters using a system called AutoNav in which the rover takes images from the front and determines if there are obstacles that it needs to go around and it automatically changes its path to continue going without earth in the loop what we call earth in the loop and that enabled it to go much further than we could the last record was 200 and i mean maybe 10 meters by the opportunity yeah. rover 
in Meridiani Planum, which was extraordinarily smooth and flat, by the way. And Jezero is much more complicated surface-wise. Uh, but this, uh, and the, using this technique, it, the thought is they can do these long drives and make its way all the way around. So, you know, Thank weeks you. to a month, I would say, um, we're looking, if we do fly across CETA with the helicopter, we're probably looking at a, you know, a handful of flights, a few flights, three, maybe five, something like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, fantastic. Um, now, you mentioned early on in your talk that this is a sample return mission in a way, although at least it's the sample gather mission. We've talked about that with our, our all space audience before. Now, the return mission is going to have to go to the locations that the samples have been stored. Will they be stored in multiple locations on Mars, perhaps? And will they bring another little helicopter to help find them? Or <laughs> what is the plan? That's a possibility. Um, so um, sample return, it turns out to be a very complicated effort. So, so first of all, what pers uh, Perseverance rover will do is it will take dual samples of everything that it decides to collect. And it will take those until it gets to the edge of Jezero Crater, at which point it will lay down one of each of those dual samples in a cache that will be near the mouth of where that, uh, that channel enters and breaches the wall of the crater. And that would be roughly the nominal mission for Perseverance. So if something happens after that and it fails or whatever, that cache would be available. If it continues to go as long as a lot of the things that we design and build, uh, which, which don't have any consumables really on board uh, that can go years and years, um, I mean, opportunity lasted, what, 10 years before. <laughs> uh, so if it keeps going, it will climb out of the crater into the adjacent highlands called Niliplanum, and mm -hmm. already identified are a whole wide variety of rocks and materials that are not available inside the crater. It would drive and sample those, including the one of each that it brought from Jezero, and when it gets to the end of its traverse, it would deposit another cache. Hmm. And then the subsequent mission would land nearby either of those caches, whichever one is decided to be the best, okay, <laughs> at a location that is smooth and flat enough for the subsequent fetch rover from the second mission to go and collect those samples. So they're each one is sitting in a little test tube and they're just sitting on the ground waiting for, uh, waiting yeah. for the next mission to come. So in fact, we're already looking at landing places and cache locations for those samples and for the next mission. So the okay. next mission carries two things or it's two missions that carry one thing each. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> one of them carries a fetch rover that is gonna land as close to that cache as it can. It will go and get those samples and it will place them into a round, I'll call it a, a bowling ball, okay? But it's hollow inside and the samples go inside this bowling ball and the top goes over and seals, and that's the sample canister. Mm -hmm. And it takes the sample canister and it drives back to where they landed and it puts it on top of a rocket. And that rocket blasts that sample canister into orbit around Mars. Mm -hmm. And that canister then orbits in a stable orbit going around and around and around and around until some future time when the third mission or fourth, depending upon exactly how you engineer it, comes and finds that bowling ball orbiting around Mars, captures it all robotically, brings it back to Earth and lands it at the Utah test range. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> and then you go collect that bowling ball sealed so that no Mars material comes back to Earth except what's inside this sealed bowling ball. And you take it to a yet to be built uh, facility that is safer than the center disease control facilities for the worst diseases we have on Earth. And you put it in there so that no Mars material can get into the Earth's biosphere without first checking it out. Right. Wow. And, well, that that sounds like I, I don't know. I shouldn't be holding my breath for this to happen. It's certainly not. not so yeah. right now, the two chunks of the sample return are being planned by both NASA and the European Space Agency, and they're talking about the late in the 2020s for those missions uh, perhaps going. So, so it may okay. not be that far along, but yeah, I wouldn't hold your breath for those samples coming down. Yeah, right I, I wonder whether we're going to see one of Elon Musk's big rockets land. <laughs> or, There'll be a Starbucks up there. Um, yeah, but I mean, you, I would, in my opinion, that might be the worst thing possible to have a human go pick it up because the contamination possibilities, everything yeah. else. That's yeah, just horrible. Uh, and robotically getting it is the way I want to do it to really get the best out of this science. That's right. And you won't know if life started on Mars. If you if you send people there and you haven't answered that question, you won't know because people are dirty. I mean, we have bugs all over the place. Yeah. <laughs> so, and yeah. we will we will certainly contaminate Mars if we send people there. So so yeah, the idea is to do this in a super clean manner with robots. Yeah. <laughs> you said something that's really remarkable to me, and I've been studying, I thought I'd been studying properly, this uh, this mission. Obviously, I knew you folks were going after the Delta and everything down in Jezero. And of course, I know I do know the gap out onto the west where the where uh, the, that goes up into the river valley. Your Your ambition to get into that river valley and then up and out and on to Nili Planum? That's almost a second mission. Yeah, I, it, I, I had no idea. Yeah, and and that hasn't been approved or <laughs> anything oh, okay. yet. I mean, obviously the rover's got to be you know oh, yeah. capable of doing it, but we are already looking at traversable paths that will allow us to go up there. Um, the rover has you know limits to uh, if it's on loose soil, it can yeah. drive yeah. up slopes about yeah. fifteen degrees. If it's yeah, about how fast. How fast can it traverse? And does it have any software to keep it from, say, driving off a ledge you didn't see? Are there, yeah, are there protective that, things built in? Yeah, that's that uh, the auto nav I was talking about, where it actually takes images every wheel rotation or so. And it is stereo images, and it calculates uh, the sizes of obstacles. And if it sees nothing, it will stop too. <laughs> mm -hmm. But but we have high enough resolution from the high rise that I showed you to, to you know, we're not going to purposely drive it off a cliff. <laughs> that's, that's, not, I mean, that's just not <laughs> no. a good idea. Yeah, that was a, that was a question from the audience, but it, it, it certainly is nice to know we have those um, checks built into the, the helicopter yeah, yeah. flying. And, and, and the reason for those checks is that you can't joystick a vehicle that's on Mars. So yeah. the one-way light time between yeah. us sending a signal to Mars and, and the rover getting it on the ground can be 10 to 20 minutes. So think about it if you were trying to virtual reality this, right? And you had a little yeah. joystick. Well, by the time you got the the picture of the rover going off the cliff, it, it already went off 10 minutes ago. It's too late. <laughs> so so that, that, that breaks all your operations up into daily, what we call plans for that Sol, that day on mm -hmm. Mars. Yeah. So the way the ops team works is that you have all these scientists and engineers huddling together, figuring out what to do the next day. Uh, at the end of the day, the rover sends back all the telemetry that it collected during that day. Um, you get it and you work for 10 to 12 hours designing the commands for the next day. By that time, it's morning on Mars. The rover wakes up. You send this command load with all the things it does. 
and it goes and does them. You can't watch it while it's doing it. It's like sending your kid off to college. You know, you mm-hmm. you did all the things you could to keep them out of trouble, but then they're on their own. You know, yeah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you yeah, yeah. Help them. They're there on their own, and it now, does everything that entire day with you. Don't you can't you don't have a clue. You can't see it. You don't watch it. Nothing. And at the end of the day, it sends back everything it did, and so that's what's called Earth in the Loop, and this. In the early part of a mission, we work on what we call Mars time, which is 38 minutes longer than Earth day. So a Mars day is 38 minutes longer than an Earth day. So in two weeks, your schedule has moved forward 12 hours. And in six weeks, it's rotated around the clock. So think about that. That's that's worse than jet lag. That's jet lag all the time. It kills you. You die. You're you know, it's horrible. <laughs> but you do it in the beginning because that that resource is so so precious, <laughs> and you want it to get out and do you know these these great things that you can. <laughs> but then you get to the point where you're so exhausted. You know, you, you haven't taken your clothes to the cleaners. You haven't gotten your hair right. cut. You haven't done anything because you're not awake at the right time of the day to do it. And you're so busy working on this rover <laughs> that that you go to Earth time and then you become a little bit more less of less efficient because you start losing days that don't line up where there's days. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, last couple of questions before we move on with the rest of our program. Someone asked about dust building up on the helicopter's solar panel. Uh, do the blades and the motion help keep dust off of that at all? Have you seen, uh, what's our concern? Interestingly enough, we just had a small dust, small dust storm on Mars just a couple of weeks ago. Um, the rover and the helicopter, the rover's not solar powered, but the helicopter is. Helicopter saw a power drop, but unlike surface missions like InSight or the other rovers that have dust that continuously falls out of the atmosphere and degrades the power situation. And in fact, for InSight, which is a lander uh, that doesn't move, it has a seismometer and it's listening for Mars quakes. Um, the, the, the dust is built up so much on the panels that the mission's gonna come to an end because of that dust buildup. And it hasn't been cleaned like they were for Spirit and Opportunity where we had these vortices or dust devils that managed to clean off the panels. Unlike all of those, I, we're guessing that because of the motion of the helicopter, that we've had no dust buildup on the panels whatsoever. And it's not mm-hmm. just because of the rotors, they're actually below the yeah. solar panel, which is above them. So, but just the action of flying and moving around appears to be enough that there's been no degradation of power uh, for the helicopter. So, so that's a plus. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's a big plus. Well, I, I thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, I think we might have lost your video, but we've had your audio at the very end here. Um, maybe it's due to Mars time. I'm not really sure. But, uh, <laughs> anyway, it's all thank- lag. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us. It's just fascinating to hear all these details about this wonderful mission to Mars. Here. And um, we'd love to have you back again next next rotation, you know, when, you, when you've got another chance again and you've got more information to tell us. Maybe when we make it up onto the Delta, I don't know. But this is just, I, I love this mission. I love that the helicopter is doing even more than we, we thought it could. Ingenuity yeah. is just, it, it's really been a, a fascinating addition to our capabilities on another planet the fact we're flying through the martian air as thin as it is is just incredible so thank you for your part and really exciting times for us and our audience and thank you again for joining us and my pleasure and i look forward to our next time yeah absolutely and i know you're going to stick around with us here as we carry on so if you have any comments make just chime in as we love to do right. um, i think we're ready to move on now katie are you there to show us some uh beautiful pictures, pretty pictures, and talk about some space weather. Yes, hello. Hi there. (laughs) All right, so first we have um, this lovely image. This one is from uh, telescope demonstrator Todd Kanioka. 
He uh, took this on December 11th. This is of Comet Leonard um, from Lake Mead National Recreation Area. And then this is a beautiful image. This is um, from Mauna Kea, the Gemini um, uh, telescope. Um, and this one was actually taken in 2017, but I included it because on the right there, you can see those incredible sprites above the clouds. And then a beautiful waxing crescent moon. This was January 4th from David Pinsky. And on the left, we have Betelgeuse. And on the right, you can see the Orion Nebula. These are from a, um, an eight inch Dobsonian. And David Pinsky actually two days ago on the second went to Vandenberg to see the Falcon 9 launch. So these are images from his trip there. Incredible. And another one from Pinsky. This is a downtown LA from Griffith Observatory on January 15. He took this with a Canon 60 MK2. And these were actually taken by Patrick. Um, these uh, are Virga formations, um, which occur when streaks of participation evaporate prior to reaching the ground. And these are lenticulars. These are my favorite oh. clouds. Um, this is from Elijah Rail, and you can see his Instagram down there. He's got some incredible uh, photos. Uh, this one was taken January 27 in uh, New Mexico. And another beautiful image from Elijah. This is a, a sunset from New Mexico. And this is another one from Todd Kunioka. This is Griffith Observatory um, during sunset. And on the top, a uh, little to the left, you can see planet Venus. This one's from December 19th. And this incredible um, image this is actually a GIF. This was taken by one of our producers, Daniel Perea, on January 15th from Na uh, Natural Bridges State Park in Santa Cruz. There we go. And on to some solar system weather. Um, sunspot AR 2929 erupted. This is um, from January 18th. This produced a uh, M 1.5 class solar flare. You can see that on the right hand side of the sun. And a lot of solar activity at the end of this month. This is also uh, January 18th. This is a uh, coronal mass ejection, and there were uh, predictions to see. Uh, some aurora on the 22nd and 23rd. And here we have some beautiful aurora from that week. These were taken by uh, Nicholas uh, Hewart, I believe is how you pronounce his name. On the left, there are polar stratospheric clouds um, with a full moon and aurora. And I'll let these play just a little bit here. These are from Sweden. So just beautiful, beautiful colors in there. Yeah. Wow, yeah. And moving on, um, this is from January 30th. The sunspot AR2936 posed a, a threat for a M-class solar flare. And then we'll move to February 1st. We had a coronal mass ejection. This is actually a halo coronal mass ejection. Um, hurtled into space. And then this is uh, February 2nd. So a lot of sunspots happening. We talked a little bit about the solar cycle last month. We are in the solar cycle 25 and our maximum is supposed to, or is predicted to occur in July of 2025. So the sunspot AR2940 here um, was predicted to have um, some solar flares and actually uh, these aurora, the one on the left was February 2nd. These are from Sweden as well from Nicholas. And the one on the right was posted nine hours ago. Is that pink streamer on the left a little bit of it? Was that an appearance of Steve maybe? The 
Oh, yes. Probably was the mysterious Steve. Steve. <laughs> just hmm. gorgeous. So just some beautiful, beautiful Aurora images uh, this month. Hopefully we will see more uh, in the next month. Well, fantastic. Amazing, amazing stuff. Well, I think it's time to head to Patrick now and let's hear what's up in our sky in February in our sky report. Patrick, what do we have to look forward to? All right, well, uh, February is uh, gonna be a, a little bit of a quiet month for, uh, for things in the sky, but there are lots of things you can still see. And uh, one, of the, one of them occurred already um, just uh, two days ago uh, when the moon was uh, uh, just close to Jupiter uh, in the evening sky as you look uh, west uh, after sunset. Now Mars, actually not Mars, um, that's, that's a Matt Gollenbeck's um, specialty. Uh, Jupiter uh, will be visible, uh, but not too much longer. Um, it's gonna be uh, visible uh, throughout much of this month, and it will disappear on the 20th as it moves um, into the glare of the sun. And actually, the sun is actually catching up to, uh, to Jupiter in uh, that part of the sky. So we're gonna lose our view of Jupiter, which is the only planet that's in our evening sky at the present time. And um, with the absence of uh, planets, we might as well uh, turn to our evening sky to see uh, uh, what are the constellations that are visible um, in our uh, winter sky. Well, if we look to the south, uh, around about nine o'clock in the middle of the month, um, some of our winter favorite constellations are already visible, uh, starting with Orion the Hunter, uh, just to the west of south, and right above it is uh, Taurus the Bull, um, with its bright star, Aldebaran. And then just uh, at its highest point in the sky, uh, below Orion is uh, Sirius. And above that, uh, the uh, two bright stars are, represent uh, Gemini, the twins, which are uh, Castor and Pollux. We're gonna go ahead and highlight uh, the constellation that most people look at, or if you're learning the sky for the first time, especially during this time of year, the constellation Orion the Hunter. Now in this photograph, uh, which was taken um, actually right by Griff Observatory, you can see the bright city lights almost drown, drowning out uh, Orion the Hunter, which is at the top of the picture. Although the stars of the Hunter are, are fairly bright and uh, at least it can pierce the, uh, the light pollution of our city and um, make it visible to our eyes. Well, what's most recognizable Orion with Orion the Hunter it, are the three stars in a row. So that catches most people's eyes because if you don't often see three stars in a row. That represents Orion's belt. Now Orion uh, has uh, four bright stars. Uh, two of them are above the belt. The one is Betelgeuse and the other is Bellatrex. And below the belt is uh, a fainter star called Sayef and uh, Rigel, uh, which you may have heard of. That's a bright uh, blue giant star. And so these four surround the belt. And if we use the belt as a pointer and you just uh, extend a line through the belt downwards, you'll end up at the brightest star in the sky that we saw earlier on, uh, which is Sirius. And Sirius is in the constellation of Canis Major, the great dog. So that's an easy way to find it. Another bright star is uh, found by extending a line from Bellatrix through Betelgeuse and all the way down to the horizon or close to the horizon, and you'll find the star uh, Procyon in the constellation of Canis Minor, the lesser dog. So Orion has two dogs, the great dog and the lesser dog marked by uh, bright stars. One of the uh, most interesting objects in Orion is just below its belt stars. And this is a uh, great Orion nebula or M42, Messe 42. Now this can be seen easily through a pair of binoculars in a dark sky location. You, you can actually see it uh, with your eyes as a kind of a faint misty patch in the sky. It looks fabulous if you had a large telescope and, uh, and time exposure photography, you can get um, colors like this. Uh, this image was taken by Anthony Perkett, uh, our telescope demonstrator. And it shows uh, the incredible beauty of uh, the Orion Nebula, which is a birthplace of stars. In our morning sky, if you're up early in the morning in the middle of the month, 
uh, there, are the, there are the spring constellations of Leo the Lion and uh, Virgo the Maiden uh, to the southwest. And close to the southeast and rising just above Griff Observatory in this uh, image are the two constellations, uh, Scorpius the Scorpion with its bright star Antares, Chris's favorite star, and uh, Sagittarius. And in Sagittarius, in this region of the sky, are two bright objects which are not stars. If we zoom into that area, we'll see um, on in the morning of uh, February the 15th, uh, the brilliant planet Venus, uh, which was in our evening sky early in January and uh, is now in the, in the morning sky, uh, just above the planet Mars. Mm. The moon joins uh, Mars and Venus um, on at the end of the month. So this is a great opportunity to, uh, to take a look at. It. And if you're lucky, you might get a glimpse of Mercury, which is very close uh, to the, uh, the east-southeast horizon. And this is just about an hour before sunrise. And here's, we'll take a look at our moon phases this month. Uh, first quarter is on the, on the 8th, full moon is on the 16th. Last quarter is on the 23rd. And because February only has 28 days and it's, it's a short month, uh, there is no uh, new moon uh, this month. So mm -hmm. that's our sky report. So go out and enjoy the skies. Wow, thank you for that, Patrick. Um, a lot of fun stuff to see this month. And I wanna take this opportunity to remind everybody, All Space Considered is put on by Griffith Observatory, which is owned and operated by the city of LA. And we like to think, Griffith Observatory Foundation, which is our nonprofit partner, and they help us in so much that we do. As you'll see on our YouTube link, there's a little donation button there that helps raise funds for our nonprofit foundation, supports our online school program. Um, just in the last two weeks, we had more than 13,000 kids get to virtually visit Griffith Observatory and take a, a virtual look through one of our telescopes. We actually bring them a live view of the sun and those sunspots are looking great. And uh, you can help make that possible by uh, joining. And we thank everybody that has made a donation tonight. I've seen several been made. So thank you so much for all that help and assistance. Um, and now uh, let's move on to out to launch and find out what, what's been going on in the launches in the world. Chris. Oh, yeah, absolutely. We've got some things to talk about, some interesting things. Um, what's going on in the out to launch? Well, first of all, um, a lot of what we're, we talk about in a lot of months these days is SpaceX launches because SpaceX is launching a lot. They're able to reuse uh, their rockets, which means that they don't have to build as many. And this is making a difference. Uh, there are so many spe SpaceX launches, it's easy to get lost in them. Now, one that I want to mention right here was a uh, launch on January 31st out of the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. This was an especially photogenic launch because it occurred right at sunset and it was a very clear sky so they got some beautiful pictures not only of the launch but of the landing and notice by the way the landing on the right of your screen is not on a barge out at sea it's on land landing zone one at the kennedy space center now this was carrying a uh, italian uh, satellite research satellite into earth orbit um, no big deal as far as that but I do want to mention that the mission was delayed a few times. Some were the more traditional reasons that you have with just technical problems, but the delay the day before, which happened at T minus 30 seconds, 30 seconds before launch, they weren't able to go. And the reason for that was somebody got in the way. Um, they actually had a cruise ship get into the area off of the Cape uh, where you're not supposed to fly. The reason they do this uh, is that if the rocket should fail or break apart during the ascent phase, there's a whole zone off the coast where material might fall back down. And it's not just one place. It's a whole stripe of ocean where this could happen because if, it, if the failure happened at a lower altitude, it would fall back sooner. If it happened at a higher altitude, it would take a longer time for the debris to come back down. It would fall farther out to sea. So there's a stripe where you have to keep out of for a safe launch. Yeah. Um, now, was it was it really the harmony of the seas? That it really the was boy? the harmony of the seas. She is a big, big cruise ship, 1,100 feet long, 6,000 passengers, big as a nuclear aircraft carrier. She's a monster. And she started heading 
right for the zone. And at the last minute, the range safety officer, officer called it and said no, which is very frustrating, of course, to a lot of people. But this isn't a million to one chance. It isn't like the captain was crazy and in an area of the ocean you wouldn't normally be. The map that is shown there shows the shipping lanes that are used by just one cargo company. There are all kinds of ships going around the East Florida coast. It's a choke point. All the cruise ships coming down from New York going to the Caribbean, I've crossed over that same patch of sea about half a dozen times on cruise ships. And then you got the pleasure boaters and all kinds of other people. Now, the reason this hasn't been that big a problem in the past is that they weren't launching as often. It was a rare big deal when the Canaveral Air Force Station would announce they were having a missile test. But SpaceX is launching more and more. They're hoping to get up to using these rockets like airliners. Well, they can't stop all the cargo sh ships and cruise ships at sea every time a plane takes off out of, you know, uh, Miami International Airport. If you're launching many times, this begins to be a problem. So uh, obviously they need to make sure people know when the launches are and get word out to these captains so they'll be out of the area. But we are going to have to come up with some solutions as we start going to space more often. Fortunately, this wasn't a problem for anybody. No safety issues. Um, another thing that wasn't a serious problem uh, is a parachute thing. It's actually neither of the exact situations you see in those pictures. We actually don't have pictures of what uh, happened on January 24th. It wasn't covered live and pictures haven't been released, but a cargo version of the Dragon spacecraft coming back for the end of mission CRS-24 uh, from the International Space Station was returning cargo off the, the west coast of Southern California. And it came down, the Dragon has four parachutes. That's another landing you see on the left of your screen. And all four parachutes came out as the thing was headed down to splashdown, but one of them, just exactly like you see in this photograph, hesitated. For about a minute, one of the four parachutes wouldn't open. It did end up opening on both this mission that you see on your screen there. That has astronauts on board, crew two um, from last year, but also this cargo run, one of them hesitated. Now, the fortunately in both cases, all, fair, all four ended up coming out. And fortunately, the Dragon only needs three to land safely. The fourth was a backup. So even if that other one hadn't opened, it would have been okay. The picture in color on the other side of your screen is not a Dragon. That's an Apollo coming back at the end of Apollo 15 in 1971. And in that case, one of the three parachutes did not open. I mean, really did not open. They hit the water extra hard but Apollo was designed for two parachutes. The third was a backup, so it was okay. What NASA is doing right now, they are looking at why occasionally one of the four parachutes on the Dragon system is opening a little bit later than the others. It seems to be perfectly okay. And the next crew mission of the Dragon is on track, which will be crew four. Uh, but we do want to look at this. So they're investigating it now. If you hear about it, for now, NASA believes the system is working just fine. The chutes come out. There's just a little bit of a delay on one of the chutes, sometimes, not all of them. Um, we already saw these pictures from David Penske of the launch up at Vandenberg Air Force Base. I want to make the note that if you have a launch in daytime, as this was from California, it, they're not as visually spectacular when the sun's up and the sky is bright blue. To really get a good look of daytime launches, what you need to do is what David did. Go up close and see it. That's how he was able to get these beautiful pictures. If we have a launch that's at twilight after sunset or before sunrise, you can get some really spectacular views where it's dark where you are, but sunshine is shining on the rocket and its plume. So that's just a note about how to observe uh, rocket launches. A little bit of space station news. We're doing a couple of upcoming supply runs to the International Space Station using robotic vehicles. Uh, the Russians are sending up a progress 
And uh, the Americans are sending up the Cygnus rocket. Neither of these launches, of course, from California. But we are continuing to supply the space station. We've talked about the question of how long does the space station go up? We've attached some new modules to the space station. The Russians just did some spacewalks, adding improvements. When will the end of the space station be? Well, it turns out we have some answers. Just recently, we knew the Americans were talking about the, uh, extending to 2028 and then to 2030. We've committed to that, but 2030 is going to be the end of the line for the ISS. The idea is that the ISS will be deorbited in 2031, dropped out of orbit by a robot uh, vehicle like a Progress that has a rocket engine on it. It'll slow it down and it'll fall back to Earth in the area shown by the red area known as Point Nemo, love the name, uh, the area most remote from human habitation. It's where we try to deorbit satellites all the time because the danger to people on the ground is much, much less. It's, it's a safe place to do it. Um, now, don't think this is the end of space stations, of course. I've already mentioned NASA is talking to private contractors to launch private space stations, and they'll be online before the ISS is retired. Um, no real news down in Boca Chica, Texas, where SpaceX is building their ginormous Starship rocket. Um, they haven't gotten approval from the Federal Aviation Administration to launch from the South Texas site just yet. We're waiting for approval. Uh, however, they are doing all the kinds of testing they need to do. What you're seeing there in the picture looks a little bizarre. Next to their huge uh, launch tower, they have these crane arms that come out that are used not only to hold onto and move the rocket onto its launch pad, but also to catch, yes, I said catch, a descending landing rocket and catch it in these arms like giant chopsticks and then put it back on the launch pad to be reused. They had to make sure the, the launch arms could hold the weight. Those are bags of water simulating the weight of a booster. So they're practicing, making good use of the time. We've been waiting for the space launch system, the giant rocket NASA, not SpaceX, NASA is building for a trip back to the moon. We had hoped that by about a week from now, we would see it roll out. Now you see Apollo 14 there rolling out on the right side of the screen. It's very dramatic when the rocket comes out of the assembly hangar and is actually rolled out into the sunshine for the first time. They've moved it back from this month to next. So March is when they're gonna do that. They're gonna roll it out to the launch complex and they're gonna do a fueling test. It'll go back inside the hangar for a few more uh, checks and all the rest of this before they actually wanna launch it to the moon. Uh, now, when, what, it, what is our time frame on launching to the moon? Uh, there are many factors involved with something like the Artemis One mission. Um, we don't know exactly when it will launch. There are windows of time in April and in May Either of those is a possibility. I'm going to bet for May. I think May is more likely. Uh, by the way, the launch windows are less constrained than they were for the moon landings in Apollo. The landings had to uh, arrive at the moon when the lighting conditions were exactly right at the landing site. That was one reason that made it a very short period of time when you could launch. We have a little bit more flexibility with Artemis 1. We're not landing, you might remember. We're actually going to be sending the Orion spacecraft to orbit the moon. Nobody on board for this. Just an orbital test around the moon. Uh, still be very exciting. Now, you may be wondering, when are we going to put people on this vehicle? Well, that would be for Artemis 2. And NASA has announced that they will be announcing publicly the names of the four astronauts who will fly on Artemis II, possibly in 2024. This will be an orbital mission around the moon, no landing, but they're going to orbit the moon. And uh, there'll be three Americans and there will be one Canadian astronaut, the first Canadian to the moon, by the way. Uh, so pretty exciting stuff. I mean, you know, wouldn't that be an amazing thing to tell your family? Since I was eight years old, this has not happened where anyone could go home and tell their family, I'm going to another world. I'm going to a place where I could cover up the earth with my thumb. It's that far away. And we're just about to get that announcement. Um, this is a picture, uh, you know, the young lady in red there, that's Tracy Cernan watching her father practice for the last moon landing. Um, 
So hopefully here in the next month, two months, we'll see, we should know the names of the people who got to go home and tell their family they are going to another world. That's a pretty wow. exciting time. With that, I'll toss it back to you, David. Thank you very That's much. That's a, a super exciting time uh, to be seeing astronauts getting ready to go back on some you know, deep space missions, really. This is the furthest we've been. Uh, one yeah. concern, of course, is the health of the astronauts. And a recent study came out talking about astronaut anemia. This is something we're familiar with, that astronauts, they become anemic while they're up in space. This study studied 14 astronauts, uh, looked at the rate they recovered when they came back to Earth. It still is not well understood what's causing this, but it does seem to be worse the longer you're there, and it takes you longer to recover when you get back to Earth as well. So this is something we're going to have to watch and, and keep an eye on. Um, uh, folks have been in space for long periods of time before. Obviously, they've made it back. Nobody's passed away due to anemia, but these long duration flights are really something we're going to have to test the, uh, the body with. Um, it, with that, we're going to move right on into our next, uh, our next study, our next thing here, which uh, skip, skip that one, um, has to do with the Ring of Fire. And uh, Patrick is going to tell us what event happened on the Ring of Fire. And um, Patrick, what went on that we're so interested in that we're talking about an undersea volcanic explosion or something went happened? What, what went on? Oh, nothing much. No, actually a lot. Um, <laughs> if, yeah. if you look at this uh, Ring of Fire map, um, there was uh, some activity going on with an undersea volcano um, in the southern portion of the Ring of Fire. Uh, you can see way down there near Australia, the Tonga Trench. And uh, that's where we're going to take a look at what happened in this picture here. This is uh, mm. an image of the volcano uh, Hunga Tonga, um, which uh, erupted uh, just uh, in the middle of last month and uh, with a lot of ash and, and steam clouds, including lots of uh, volcanic lightning. It, it, was, it was a hub of activity. Now, just exactly where is this place where well, we saw in the map there, uh, the Ring of Fire is off, off of Australia. Hangatanga is uh, located roughly about 1,200 12, miles um, just uh, north of uh, New Zealand. And uh, we're gonna just zoom into the area here because there is actually some interesting geological activity that's happening. So what we see here is Hangatanga. It's uh, just positioned on uh, top of uh, an ocean uh, plate called the Australian plate. And, that's, and then to the right is the Pacific plate, the vast Pacific ocean. So here we're looking at uh, a map of uh, the actual sea floor or the ocean floor. And that arrow from the Pacific plate indicates the direction of motion of the Pacific plate, which is colliding with the Australian plate. If we take a cross section of that area and kind of in a generalized diagram, we can see what's happening. The Pacific plate is being pushed underneath the Australian plate. Uh, and um, there's an area about 50 to about 100 miles uh, below which uh, the pressures and the temperatures increase so much so that uh, the rock begins to melt in the ocean crust. Now it's water rich and uh, the water lowers the boiling point of, uh, of melting rock. And so this melting rock accumulates in a kind of a giant cavity called a magma chamber and uh, the hot rock has only one way to go because it's hot and less dense. It goes straight up and goes through vents and eventually uh, works its way up to the top of the uh, ocean crust and uh, forms an undersea volcano, which is the case of uh, Hanga Tanga. Uh, just to take a look at a profile, you can see it is a volcano which is kind of uh, elevated from the uh, sea floor. And uh, you can see that gray area there. Those, that's actually a, the part of the volcano that's just above uh, the, uh, the ocean level. That's uh, the visible part. The rest of it is beneath the ocean. This gives you a better view of the actual volcano. It's roughly about 20 uh, kilometers across in diameter. And it's about 1.8 kilo kilometers uh, from the uh, ocean floor um, all the way up. And that scale on the right there, uh, which uh, says uh, depth, 
that, that indicates the uh, meters below sea level. So all the yellowish and uh, sandy parts are the highest point of that uh, volcano. But the rest of it, the caldera, is uh, deep beneath uh, the, uh, the uh, ocean level. To get a sense of what it looks like, um, we can take a look at uh, pictures taken by this satellite, which is uh, owned by the French uh, space agency, the Pleiades satellite. It's uh, re orbits uh, roughly a height of uh, 640 uh, kilometers above the Earth, so it only goes over this area um, a, um, about once a day. And it's been taking pictures of this uh, undersea volcano uh, for, for a few years now. So we're gonna take a look at how, how it looks uh, back in 2014. Uh, with, it was, Hunga Tunga was uh, two islands and actually, it has two names. The island on the left is known as Hunga, Tung, Hunga Haya Pier, and the one on the right is uh, Hunga Tunga. Uh, both of them are roughly about a mile across. And it really hides, because this is almost like the tip of an iceberg, in this case, a volcan volcanic iceberg, so to speak, that the rest of the volcano is just hidden underneath the, uh, the ocean there. So this represents uh, a portion of the rim of the volcano that's uh, been uh, that's visible. Now there had been some activity back in 20, 2009, and uh, there was that happened on the uh, the Hunga Haya Pier Island, and then in twenty fourteen to um, late to actually early twenty fifteen, uh, there was another major eruption. Uh, so much ash and rock was uh, was thrown up from this eruption that it settled down and formed a land bridge between these two islands, which is amazing. The bridge is roughly about 1.5 miles across, uh, bridging the gap between these uh, two islands. Um, there was more activity uh, uh, that happened uh, after uh, 2015 and the island grew in size. Uh, and then last year in December uh, 20th, uh, it erupted again, so there's periods of activity and then there's periods of quietness. Well, last, uh, last year there was uh, uh, another eruption uh, that um, you can see here, and this actually was taken on January 3rd. You can see steam coming from the event, so it, it wasn't a big, a big re eruption, but enough uh, just to, uh, to be visible uh, from the uh, satellite. The eruption continued uh, through to January 11th, and uh, the, the volcano went quiet again. So geologists thought, well, uh, the volcano has become dormant again, it's, and nothing's going to happen. But then this picture uh, was taken in uh, on January 15th, and look what's happened. The middle yeah. of the island, one third of it has disappeared. It's, it's collapsed beneath the water and has collapsed um, under, uh, towards the uh, caldera of the, uh, of the undersea, undersea volcano uh, beneath it. So, uh, so we got this picture, but uh, you know, the, the satellite, as I was saying, that uh, only has, has to fly over this region to monitor it, so it can't monitor it all the time. What can monitor um, activity is this satellite, which is uh, the, the NOAA's GOES uh, 17 satellite, a weather satellite that is in geostationary orbit. That means it sees the same face of the Earth 24-7. Uh, and uh, it's uh, programmed to take pictures of the Earth every, every few minutes just to see the movement of clouds so, uh, so we can see what the weather conditions are like all over the Earth. Well, on January 15th, uh, you know, just during its uh, routine uh, picture taking, as it as, as it's programmed to do, um, we saw um, this, and it just looks like a regular day. But wait a minute, <laughs> what the? What's going on there? Oh, that is the exact location of the Hunga Tunga volcano, which literally exploded <laughs> and uh, caused and actually caused a gigantic plume to uh, be visible from a satellite uh, 22,000 miles away. That's just unbelievable. And uh, unbelievable 
because it was actually captured uh, for the first time with a satellite in almost kind of real time, but you know, every, uh, every few minutes a picture was taken yeah. to make this, uh, uh, to actually capture the, uh, the eruption uh, of an explosive event that has not been seen by a satellite. All right, there's some more stuff too. Uh, let's go to the uh, Japanese satellite called Himawari 8. And you can, if you look at this, look at the shock wave that is blasted ahead of the plume. And that has never been seen before. This is just, uh, just totally amazing. So, so you would think, okay, well, that doesn't look very big, does it? Oh, here's another image. You see it again from the, a close up from the Himarari yeah. satellite. Wow. All right, we'll put this to scale. All right, here's California. You can see Los Angeles and San Francisco. Here's the plume. Oh, super wow. large. I mean, it, oh. it, it, it just gives you <laughs> an idea of scale of things um, when you compare it to. To, um, to land masses here, because uh, out in the ocean, it's vast. Now the explosion was so powerful, it uh, sent a, a, a shockwave blast uh, moving at 700 miles per hour. Uh, so that's faster than a jet airliner. And it took uh, hours to uh, cross the ocean. By the time it reached uh, Alaska over nine hours uh, later, uh, booms were actually heard by residents. The explosion itself, was heard, uh, it, it was, people heard it. It was just, you know, unbelievable. Furthermore, the uh, shock wave, wave actually registered on a buoy out in, uh, in Nantucket. And you can see in those circles there, those little blips there are uh, sudden increases in uh, pressure. This uh, next uh, image is kind of the map mm. of the shock, shock yeah. wave radiating out. And that shock wave, uh, uh, circled the earth three times. It, it was that, that much powerful. Now, you know, from, from Los Angeles, we wouldn't feel the sun increase uh, in pressure or anything like that, but uh, instruments were sensitive enough to, uh, to show this. We could actually see the visible effects of the shock wave uh, from uh, footage taken from webcams at um, Mauna Kea in different directions. And if you watch very carefully, look for the red wave ripples that occur they're not there oh there we go yeah there here it is here it comes yeah, i see it so that's from one camera looking in one direction there's another view from a different camera in another direction there you see the, the waves so there we go yeah moving through wow yeah and that's in Hawaii. That's a long yep. way from Hunga Tonga. Yep. And so apart from the waves, uh, there was a tsunami of just 20 minutes after the eruption, um, a tsunami of, uh, with waves up to uh, six foot uh, washed across the island of, uh, of Tonga, which was about 40 miles away. And, uh, caused a lot of uh, devastation uh, to the island, which um, they are still picking up the pieces um, even today. Um, the wave also continued this journey across the, uh, across the ocean uh, to New, Ze New Zealand. Parts of New Zealand were, were hit by four foot waves. And uh, this also uh, caused um, a tsunami alert uh, from National Weather Service for all of the uh, West Coast. And also from other international agencies, uh, such as in Japan and Southeast Asia. Uh, here in Los Angeles, uh, we had our own tsunami advisory. And uh, the waves here weren't too bad. Uh, they were just about one to two feet. And people were told to stay away from the coastal areas until the tsunami advisory and warning had uh, passed. Um, surfers were kind of interested, perhaps they thought the waves would be interesting to ride, to ride on. So what kind of atmospheric effects came from this? Well, there was a lot of millions of tons of ash and dust were ejected up into the atmosphere and uh, some as high as uh, 30, 55 kilometers in height, almost halfway 
up to the uh, the um, edge of space, which is incredible. Uh, the space station saw the uh, ash and cloud uh, move over the uh, even from uh, from their vantage point, move a large over large areas of the uh, of the planet from the Hunga Tonga explosion. Uh, this is a particularly dense region of cloud. Um, even satellites uh, monitored uh, the gases released, uh, which carried the ash and dust. And you can see a portion over Australia. And uh, pictures taken of sunrise over Queensland showed very unusual um, skies as the ash uh, rolled across and uh, caused the reddening of, uh, of the sunlight uh, as the sun rose. These airy sights were, were just uh, incredible to see um, if, if you were actually there uh, watching a sunrise or even a sunset. What has become of the island? Well, this is a recent picture, well, si since January 16. Um, the, all the activity has stopped, but you can see that the island, but it it's looks a lot smaller. And this next image shows you a before and after. So December, oh. Dave, that whole, the honest, <laughs> yeah. Wow. The explosion basically obliterated the, the islands and you can see only little small pieces of it uh, left over. So uh, this is uh, almost a once in a lifetime opportunity. Uh, geologists say that this type of eruption uh, takes place on the order of uh, every thousand years and uh, it happened to ha happen uh, during our lifetimes. So yeah. incredible. Really, really incredible stuff. Super, super interesting, Patrick. Um, but what were the effects for climate, I want to say? I want to move into that part of the discussion as we're running out of time here tonight. Um, so looking at that, um, Earth, of course, is warming up. A lot of people want to say, well, volcanoes produce CO2. And that CO2, as we know, is a climate changing gas. It's going to warm us up. Well, uh, let's look at the billions of tons per year. Global volcanic emissions they're grabbing the higher estimates is only 0.26 billion metric tons, whereas humans produce 32.3 billion metric tons. Um, so yeah, it's just, it's not even in the same ballpark. It's, it's 0.2 versus 32. So the volcanoes aren't causing the warming, but they can change the climate actually. These hydrogen sulfides and hydrogen halides, well, they do cause some things because you can see here, they, well, they block out, uh, you know, the sunlight, will it change the temperature? Well, we know it's not good stuff to breathe, pretty nasty stuff. Um, that sulfur dioxide and ash, as you saw Patrick show, indeed does block the sunlight and it spreads around and blocks it. But ash is not super effective at, at cooling things down. It, it falls down pretty rapidly and doesn't block a lot of the sunlight. But what does is the photochemistry as that sulfur dioxide interacts, turns into sulfuric acid. That's right, we get acid rain falling out of it. And that becomes a very reflective cloud up in the upper atmosphere. So it turns out that this sulfur dioxide is a cooling agent. It's poisonous too. You, you don't want to breathe it. Not good. And it will cool off the earth. And you can see here again that eruption injecting material high into the atmosphere. And it could cause cooling. There's that SO2 plume made its way all the way over to Australia from mm -hmm. Hunga Tonga volcano. And well, is it going to cause cooling there in Australia? Probably not. Those beautiful sunsets, yes, it has the effect. This is actually Mauna Loa erupting, which gives off CO2 as well. Um, but the, the Tonga eruption did not really create a lot of sulfur dioxide. Uh, the Pinatubo eruption back in 91, maybe some of you remember, it did cool things down just a little bit. We had beautiful sunsets and it, it got a little chillier. It changed the climate, but you can see how much more sulfur dioxide was given off a lot more was given off in that eruption. Um, so Chris, how does this compare to Krakatoa? Well, a big one. Oh back. yeah. Yeah, this is, this is an example where these things happen if you live on an active planet and these things have happened before. And probably the most famous example of this sort of thing happening in the Pacific with a volcanic island deciding to check out is Krakatoa, 27th August of 1883. And in fact, a lot of people in the audience probably know vaguely the word Krakatoa, just then maybe don't even know why. It just means something, right? Something bad, something big. Well, it was a huge explosion, bigger even than this one. Now, they have a scale for the Volcanic Explosivity Index, they call it. Uh, 
the famous Mount St. Helens in 1980 in the Pacific Northwest of the US, that was a five on that scale. Then Hunga Tonga is five and a half on that scale. Krakatoa was a full six. It was a bigger deal. Same sort of idea where an island basically explodes, although it was a more deadly kind of explosion, what they call a pyroclastic flow. And because of this, yes, there were tsunamis and everything else, but the explosion was a, a more deadly type. And the death toll was much more than what we're looking at today from this event. Uh, latest estimates I've heard from Hunga Tonga, it looks like maybe five or six people lost their lives. Uh, for Krakatoa back in 1883, the death toll was more than 36,000. It was a huge deal. Um, and like with, crack, or like with Hunga Tonga, um, the explosion was heard a huge distance away. In fact, with Krakatoa, 3,000 miles away, people heard it. And pressure waves went all the way around the earth. There were tsunamis, all the rest of these kinds of things. Similar to what we've seen this time, but actually a bit more powerful. So this is a good example that these things happen where we, we just show pictures of the sunsets where they change colors. The sky can change color. Well, the picture, the very famous picture you've got on the right there, The Scream by Edvard Munch. Um, that picture, it turns out, was painted 10 years after the Krakatoa eruption, but the skies for years in the Northern Hemisphere were reddish. Everyone noticed this for years and years. And it's a theory that people have, this painting, the red sky behind him, might actually be inspired by Krakatoa. So it enters our culture and our memory. So when we think Hunga Tonga, remember also uh, Krakatoa, east of Java, 1883. Wow. Uh, so th th these do happen. This they wasn't do. the largest explosion, but those images that Patrick showed us capturing it from space, unlike anything I've ever seen before, those pressure waves, all the rest, yeah. we get an unprecedented view of these things these days. <clears throat> well, I'm going to finish up very quickly here for tonight with a final story that's a little bit about astronomy, although it's radio astronomy research. Turns out that they recently found a strange, mysterious radio signal. Well, <laughs> mysterious. Uh -oh. it, was a, uh, it, it was a radio noise coming from a direction. It came from the oh. disk of our galaxy from a particular object. Turns out we think it was probably some sort of magnetar, a magnetized object, the core of a star that died, a pulsar. But instead of it spinning maybe once every couple of seconds for a normal pulsar, this thing spun once every 18 minutes we we were picking picking it up. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe it's a, a, a magnetar, could be a white dwarf, maybe, but very, very, very strange object. You can see here the radio signals that were picked up about uh, 20 minutes apart. And the, the pulses lasted, you know, handfuls of, I forget the exact length of each of these signals. Um, see if it says here in my, uh, Anyway, I'm not seeing what, what it was there, but they did measure it for 84 days. And the signals being that far apart means this thing is spinning very slowly. It has slowed down mm -hmm. this much. It's, it's pretty strange for this object. So you can kind of picture it here spinning off in space. Um, the, the, the material coming off those poles is, is kind of what we're picking up, those radio signals as it goes around each time, like a lighthouse, we'll hear mm -hmm. boom, a radio signal, then another radio signal. But very, very, very slowly. So um, they'll do more studies of this object, obviously find out more what it's about, but uh, you'll see things in the news of mysterious radio signal. Right. It's, it's not aliens, <laughs> uh, very no. unlikely when, when it's something like this. Um, it doesn't pass the test for an alien signal, unfortunately. Now, next month at All Space Considered, we have another great guest, um, you know, we have my, my PhD advisor, actually, Dr. Raja Guthakirta is going to come join us on March 4th to talk about, well, going on a Keck run, actually. He is has a night of Keck observing that night, and he's going to kind of bring us along to see what that's all about. It's going to be a lot of fun when we do that next month when you come join us. So, um, indeed, we're looking forward to that. Tune in. You'll get to see, what well, is he going to be in Hawaii? No, not quite, but he is going to be running the instruments that are there, and we're going to be able to look <laughs> over his shoulder as he does that, so it's going to be a lot of fun. Anyway, I get once again, I want to thank uh, Chris, wonderful time tonight. Patrick, 
awesome job with that uh, exploding volcano. Just insane. And with the Sky Report, of course, Katie, with your beautiful pictures in Sky Report. Um, I'm Dr. David Reitzel uh, from Griffith Observatory, uh, City of Los Angeles, and our Griffith Foundation that gives us all the support. And finally, once again, um, I thank our guest, everybody. A round of applause for Matt Gollenbeck yeah, yeah, yeah. for that wonderful presentation <laughs> to the Ingenuity Helicopter. Matt, you're there. Thank you again so much for joining us. Just Thank so you. awesome to hear it from um, the man that's that's getting the helicopter safe to those next landing locations. You know, that's you know like one of my favorite things is we're seeing. I don't know. I've always loved flight, and to see it happening on another yes. planet is just. I couldn't have imagined it would be happening, and it, and it is. You know, when it was announced. Uh, anyway, you can see I'm just giddy about it still. So thank you for joining us, and I can't wait to see and hear more from Mars. So thanks for joining us, folks. Wonderful audience. I really appreciate you all being there, and we'll see you all again next month at All Space Considered. Good night. Thank you.